Welcome to Reality Bites. This is Desley Casey and Sue Pavlik. And uh, today we have a special guest with us, Brian Mitchell, who is a federal member for Lions. He was elected to the House of Reps in 2016. And um, today we're going to talk to Brian about the crisis that is housing in Australia. And if we can squeeze in some other issues as well. So welcome to you, Brian. And um, let's get on with it. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Brian. Uh, Brian, what party are you with? Oh, my mistake. That's all right. No, so I'm with the Australian Labor Party. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Just for our viewers and listeners, so they they know where you're from. So, do you want to lead off? <laughs> okay. So, the, I've, um, I'm sure you're familiar, Brian, that that we're at a crisis point in um, affordable housing in this country. And I know Labor has some issue, you know, some plans for that. I'd love for you to share some of that with us as to how um, we're going to overcome this crisis. You know, where we're looking at um, rentals through the roof, mm -hmm. affordable housing, non-existent if you're low income earner. Well, you're right. We are in a housing crisis. Absolutely. I was staggered to read in the Examiner newspaper today, one of our Tasmanian dailies, that John Howard's been reported saying he doesn't believe there is a housing crisis. And I just, you know, from a former prime minister to not understand that the entire country is gripped by this, and particularly in Tasmania, um, just beg his belief. Labor believes there is a housing crisis. That's all the, that uh, matches up the feedback that we get. The people who are on very high rents the very low availability of rentals in the private and public markets. And of course, the ballooning price of buying a home, even a modest home, um, is just through the roof. So the, 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 there's been market failure for sure. Um, Labor has a couple of ideas here. They won't fix the problem overnight, but they're a start. So we've got what we call a, a Housing Australia Future Fund. Uh, that's a $10 billion fund that we will enact if we're elected to government, and that will build 30,000 new social and affordable housing properties across the country in the first five years of a Labor government if we are elected. Um, that will include 20,000 social housing properties, and 4,000 of those will be allocated for vulnerable women and children such as those escaping domestic violence, because as we know, women escaping domestic violence have nowhere to turn to. Um, and we'll also reserve 10,000 homes for frontline workers, because what we're finding is uh, workers need to work in our capital cities and our, our major regional cities, but they're being priced out of those areas. So they are facing hours, one hour, two hour commute from their home they can afford into their place of work, and that's just unsustainable. That's not fair for them, for their quality of life, uh, and it's, it's, just, it's just not right. So we will reserve 10,000 affordable homes for frontline workers to ensure they can live closer to where they work. That's the big one. The other one that we're looking at for, for regional Australia, which will include Tasmania, is a regional first home buyer support scheme. Um, and what this essentially en enables people to do who are first home buyers is purchase a home for up to $400,000 and that will move depending on where, um, where ceilings go. So no doubt that 400,000 will go up at some stage. Uh, so you you'll be able to buy a home for up to $400,000 with a 5% deposit and escape the mortgage insurance fees. At the moment, banks normally insist that you have a 20% deposit and if you want to buy a home with less than a 20% deposit, you have to uh, use mortgage insurance, which insures the bank, not you, yeah. um, and you pay the fee. You pay like 10, 15, $20,000 in fees for that insurance. So Labor's plan will say you can uh, buy a house for up to $400,000 with only a 5% deposit, not a 20% deposit, and escape those mortgage insurance fees. So taken together, those two policies will help. They won't fix the crisis and we won't pretend that they will, but they'll really help 
to um, bring downward pressure on the on on the um, ballooning price of rentals and and purchased homes. Just on that point, Brian, I I reside on the south coast of New South Wales, so I'm in a regional area. Um, if we take the point, you're right. People are commuting, particularly emergency personnel. Um, if they can, but the actual price, of, you know, market prices of houses in the Shoalhaven area is around six hundred thousand to start with. So, so the, the the four hundred thousand is a cap in Tasmania on yeah. the mainland. It's it's higher. Yes. Um, I think I think it even goes up to depending on the area up to eight hundred odd thousand dollars in some areas. So yeah, on the mainland. And in some of those bigger regional centres, that cap goes up. Yes. But currently, the cap in Tasmania is four hundred thousand. Has Labor got a policy on the uh, accommodation rental market? Because in my area, like I know one lady, for example, with children uh, and a carer, um, she has major health issues, and she has applied for 500 rentals in the Shoalhaven area and basically been knocked back on every one of them. Yeah. Uh, apart from the fact that the housing stock is just not there for rentals. Mm. And that's, I think, and we're, we're, we're no exception, you know? Yeah, oh, it's, it's nationwide, absolutely. The, the short answer is no. Unfortunately, there's no quick fix. Um, what we've seen over the last 10 years and probably even longer is state governments and the federal government have failed to build enough public housing. For some reason, years ago, excuse me, <clears throat> governments decided to essentially get out of the business of running public housing. Um, so that they left it more and more to the private market. And what we're seeing with various governments is they are outsourcing even their public housing management over to the non-profit sector or to the private sector to manage. So governments don't want to be involved in housing. I can speak for myself personally. I can't speak on behalf of the Labor Party. I think that's a mistake. I think uh, it's when governments are involved in public housing, that's a good thing. And I also don't think government public housing should be reserved just for people who are very poor. I, I think uh, you know, the more you can afford to pay, by all means, the rent should go up until it reaches a commercial rent, you know, so if, you, if you're, for example, let's say you're a student and you've got a, a flat, um, then you pay what you can afford as a student. Let's say as a student, you then get a job. You shouldn't have to move out just because you've got a job. You should, you know, your rent should go up uh, and you may want to live there and have a, have a family there. Who knows? Uh, you shouldn't have to move on just because of that, but your rent should go up. And then, of it course, does. what the government... What the it government does. should do, yeah. What the government should do is then uh, build more flats and more homes for for people elsewhere. Well, um, Brian, Brian, we were talking to Michelle uh, just before Easter, who is in with a community housing provider in New South Wales. Um, now the condition she's living in is absolutely atrocious. Yeah. Yeah, you know, she's got black mould and yeah. flooding issues. You name it, she's got it. And she is paying market rent. Yeah. Literally market rent with the housing provider because her carer uh, lives in, yeah. uh, in the premises as well. But the community housing provider, I agree government should be a lot more involved in... Um, social housing because the community providers are not putting the money that they collect in rents properly into actual upkeep and maintenance mm -hmm. and some of these dwellings really should be either demolished or you know the tenants be given emergency accommodation up until that the full renovations and issues are rectified and uh, then move back in. It's disgusting what's happening in the community housing sector. 
and Tasmania is no different, I can assure you. Oh, oh absolutely not. I mean, we, we have those horror stories all the time. We've, I've dealt with them personally. I've gone to people's homes and inspected them. I must say, these are, so, these are state government responsibilities, but yeah. when people come to my office desperate for assistance, the last thing I'm going to say to them is, not my problem, you go and see a state MP. We try and help people as well. Um, and we've had people, like, their kids have got asthma and the carpets are full of black mould. Um, and normally you'd say you've got to get out of here quickly, but there's literally nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. I, I'm usually five years ago, six years ago, when I say make sure you exercise your rights as a tenant, you know, you have certain rights to, you know, maintenance and upkeep and safety and all those sorts of things. I find myself saying that less and less now because I know the law might say that people are entitled to the rights to these things. Um, but the reality is if people exercise those rights, and say to a landlord, look, I've got a leaky tap, I want you to fix it. The landlord says, oh, well, here's your eviction notice because I'm doing a major renovation. And that person's got nowhere to go. The landlord doesn't fix the tap bring, and brings in another tenant who's quite happy to pay more rent and live with a leaky tap. So there are real problems here. And it also includes problems to do with Australia's tenancy laws across the country. Yeah. Australia's never been a country that's paid a lot of attention to tenancy protection because we've, we've traditionally been a home buying country. People usually rent for a short term before they generally go into home buying. But more and more, people are renting long term. You know, they're, I think increasingly we're going to see people become lifelong renters. I don't particularly think that's a good thing. I think for people who want to live that way and not have all the, the burdens of, of a mortgage, good. Um, but I think more and more people are being forced into being long-term renters and they're going to require more protections, I think. Uh, at the moment, I think the, the laws are very much weighted towards the rights of landlords. You know, people can't have pets. Um, they, uh, landlords can intrude themselves pretty readily on people's lives. Uh, I think we're going to have to look at other jurisdictions around the world where long-term renting is more normalised and maybe take some tips from them about the sorts of protections we need to have in Australia. And let me say, it's a two-way street. I also think landlords deserve protection from bad tenants as well. So I don't want to think, you know, it's not all bash the landlords. Uh, I think there are bad tenants out there and they need to be dealt with. Um, and the landlords need to be protected from them, them as well. But I think we, we need to take a much stronger look as a country uh, at tenancy laws because we just haven't paid a lot of attention to it over the years, because traditionally we've been a home buying country. Brian, just one quick on, on that issue. Like, does Labor have any kind of plan for the future? This probably may come up later. In people like just going out and buying lots and lots of houses, like in where I am in Delray, um, a man from Sydney in the last two years has purchased numerous properties, four in my street alone, and then gone and doubled their rent. So that's gone from 275 a week to 475 a week without any up, you know, not even a lick of paint on them. Is there anything that Labor has in plan that will, you know, address that issue? Because you know, people are now paying more than 80% of their income yeah. in rent, and that's just insane. It, oh, insane is the right word. I mean, housing stress is described as anything over 30%. So yeah. you're in housing stress if you're paying more than 30% of your income. And a, a lot of people now would be paying at least 50% of their income if they're on low incomes. Uh, and as you say, up to 70 to 80%. Uh, and we, we're seeing people sharing homes now where, you know, two, three, four people will get together to share a home uh, and they're paying $250 each for a room. You yeah. know, it's just extraordinary. Yeah. Look, again, the short answer is nothing specific, but I do think the long-term answer is to get more housing supply. Those issues of what I call rip-off rents, and they are rip-off rents, um, they'll be dealt with when there's more choice in the market. When you have more housing choice, when tenants can take their pick, and say, well, I'm not going to pay that ridiculous amount of rent when I can choose a property down the road or in the next town for half that, then yeah. pretty soon that rent goes down. It's not as if you know, they, they won't be able to charge it. So that's, that's the best way. 
we need more housing supply. That used to happen. This is a fairly modern phenomenon where demand has built up and up like a pressure cooker and the market hasn't been able to deal with it. Because what would normally happen, <coughs> excuse me, is that the, the demand would be there and then a builder or a developer would come along and go, oh, gee, there's a lot of demand there. There's an opportunity here to make a bit of money. I'll build some homes. I'll build a ute, some units or some homes and somebody will obviously rent those or buy them because there's, there's a clearly a demonstrated demand. But what we've seen over the last year is the demand's there, but nobody's building the new homes. And we've got to ask ourselves, well, why is that? And I've got a couple of reasons. One, we've got a skills crisis in the country in terms of construction trades. Every trader you talk to is flat out. Uh, builders are flat out. They are tearing their hair out and not being able to find qualified subbies. And the reason for that is because nine years ago, the uh, federal liberal government, what they did was they cut $6 billion out of TAFE training. Did you know, for example, that we've got 85,000 fewer apprentices and trainees today than we had when Labor left office in 2013, despite ongoing eco economic growth? So it's like the butterfly effect. You cut the funding back then, we end up with less qualified tradespeople doing things. And now we're wearing the consequences. There's this massive labour shortage in these key areas. So we need to get the trades and skills up again. And we've got a plan to do that with our TAFE plan and free TAFE. But also the other thing, which is not necessarily the government's immediate fault, is that the supply chain for foreign supplies was cut because of COVID. You know, all those ships that used to come in with you know, timber and steel and frames and, you know, all, all of those supply chains have been disrupted and that's still ongoing. There's a worldwide shortage of construction timber. You know, it just beggars belief that, um, pe you know, builders can't get construction timber anywhere in the world, you know, oh. and, and we need it for trusses and we need it for frames. And they just and so the price of that's going through the roof, um, and so we, we need to you know plant more trees for plantations and hardwood and softwood, but of course they take thirty years to grow, so um, not an immediate not an immediate fix, um, and the, the price of supplies as well because the supply chains have been cut, everybody's desperate for those supplies, they're willing to pay more, so that drives the price up. And that's feeding into the price of homes, both in terms of rents and just, uh, and new homes. And just as a side angle to that, but also a very, very important issue when you're talking about supply chains and everything like that, is the actual cost of living pressures. Yeah. Now, Labor is touching on it, tinging on it with, uh, we'll, we'll build more social housing, but we'll will have uh, you know, yeah. special home deposits, et cetera. But, you know, the great solution of, um, well, if, you, if you're paying too much in rental, buy a home. But then you've got, which is the LMP, what, what was it? Uh, yeah, Morrison, Morrison said it, yeah. Morrison crazy. said buy a crazy. home. Now, this is crazy because cost of living is going up. Yes. Um, and Sue and I were talking about that before you came on, actually, just what I paid at the grocery store on Monday mm. uh, and that sort of thing. But cost of living is going up. Childcare is 40% over the last what, three or four years has gone yeah. up. Petrol, uh, well, the excise, the great, ex, you know, uh, no excess, excise tax for six months, well, then what do people do after six months? Do, I, do we have our petrol living in a rural area and having to drive uh, 30, 40 minutes up the highway mm. or down the highway to a major centre? You know, petrol is a big one for me, mm. uh, even though I have a small car and, and that. But um, the cost of living... Um, is also feeding into this supply chain as well, which is also then going to feed into also even further impact housing affordability. Mm. Uh, 
across the sector. I know Labor is starting, you know, with the social housing. Um, but also, too, there appears to be no proper legislation that landlords can't put up the rent by $40, mm. 60 or $100 a week. They can set their own price, which is absolutely crazy. Mm. Um, standard. Yeah, and that's pretty standard that I hear, particularly across my area, you know, $40, $50, $70, uh, you know, a week just gone up. Now, people, how are they supposed to keep a roof over their head and keep food yeah. in their bellies well, and that of their children? That's that right. Is? I'll briefly touch on that. I mean, uh, different states have different rules about um, rent rent prices, um, about how much landlord can put them up in what period. If it's within a lease period, they have to give a certain amount of notice, but it changes from state to state. It would be helpful, I think, if there was more uniformity across the country, um, so they're not wildly different from each other, depending on which state you're in, but that's just the reality of a federation. Different states will set different different rules. Um, again, I think we need to have a, a big look at tenancy and landlord protection overall, because I think we need to take a, a deeper dive into the, the whole issue, you know, whether it's rent controls or um, allowing people to have pets and under what circumstances, uh, the issue of landlord access to a property, um, the issue of, of rights around eviction, you know, all sorts of things need to be taken a much deeper look at because I think we've only paid lip service till now because we've thought, I think generally we've sort of thought, well, not that many people rent long term, so it's a fairly sort of short term problem. But more and more people are going to be renting, and they're going to be in. You know, you'll end up with people who are renting a particular home for 20, 30 years. I mean, they'll start. You know, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the landlord might change over multiple um, different ownerships, but but the tenant may may stay. And other countries have done this. Uh, you know, in Europe, so in Germany, Italy, you know, where there's there is a, a longer tradition of lifetime renting, um, there are different protections in place in terms of how people interact with, with each other as landlords and tenants. And we need to look at that. I think in Australia, we've had a view, you know, if you own a property, you can pretty much do what you like and tenants sort of have to put up with it. And you know, I come to the issue of pets, for instance, um, in Tasmania, uh, even before the housing crisis, very, very few landlords would allow you to have pets for no reason. They just say no pets allowed. Um, that's going to change. You know, pets are an important part of people's well-being. They they keep people company. They keep them mentally healthy. Yeah. Um, unless there's a good reason, you know, why a property can't have a cat or a dog in it, then maybe landlords shouldn't have the automatic right of veto just because they own the property. But that takes a pretty big shift in thinking um, from from traditionally what we're about. In terms of cost of living, more generally, Desley, you're right. For the first five years I was an MP, um, healthcare in Tasmania was the number one issue that people were coming to see me about, the lack of access to GPs, the how much it's costing these days. But in the last six to nine months, cost of living through the roof, absolutely the number one issue without a doubt. I have what I call mobile member stalls where I go out because my electric takes up half the state of Tasmania. <laughs> so I, I'm at different, uh, so Deloraine, St Helens, uh, Bridgewater, all sorts of different places. Um, and uh, people will come up to me at the supermarket and they'll show me their shopping trolley, say, Brian, I'm getting a fraction of what I was getting just six months ago for, for what I'm paying now. And that's just groceries. Petrol's mm -hmm. through the roof, housing costs through the roof. And now we're seeing, you know, this week, uh, wholesale power prices are yeah. through the roof. Um, in Tasmania, in Hobart, inflation's 5.8% nationally 5.1%. Um, and what that means is people have less spending power um, and everything's going up except wages and, of course, except fixed incomes like pensions. So, yeah, that crunch is absolutely real. In terms of how we fix it, again, no short-term overnight fix. Any politician who says, I've got a fix for you on this and it'll happen overnight is lying to you. Um, what we need to do is get the levers right in the economy, which will drive the growth that will bring downward pressure on these things when it takes time. So one of the big things we're doing on the labour side is to, as I've said before, is to drive uh, wages higher by incentivising 
advanced manufacturing, uh, incentivizing education, training, skills. By, by getting people with more money in their pocket in terms of wages, it, it can then help drive down the cost of living more generally and then get those supply chains in, in just help even out those supply chain pressures. So um, we need to make more things in Australia. That's one of the things we've learned over COVID by relying too much on overseas things. We need to have the supply chains in Australia. So we, we, can, we can do it. We're confident we can do it, but it won't happen overnight. Yeah. Well, nothing good will happen overnight. We know that for sure. Just on, um, we know, um, you know, Medicare is definitely a labour thing. So I feel that it's in good hands. It's in a disaster at the present. You know, you've got to, I mean, bulk billing is just crazy no. and which is flooding our hospitals because if people need treatment, they need to go, you can't afford the gap, $100 yeah. for a specialist. Yeah. You're going to queue up at the hospital. That's right. So I guess Labor will have that all in hand if they're elected? Yeah, yes. We, we, um, we've announced what we call an urgent care centre uh, policy. Um, so we, we, we will fund 50 urgent care centres like, to be located near various hospitals. So here in Tasmania, there'll be one near the Royal Hobart, one near Launceston, and one near the Northwest, in, up in Burnie. Um, and what those urgent care centres will be, there'll be bulk build clinics open from 8am to 10pm every day. And they'll be able to take care of things like sprains, you know, minor broken bones, um, the sort of needly things that are important, but you don't need to be going to accident and emergency for. And so you're absolutely right. We've been accused for the last two elections of what the Liberals call Medi-Scare, you know, because we've been warning voters, the Liberals are coming after Medicare. And we're told, oh, no, they're not. It's all in safe hands. What we're seeing with the Liberals, they've changed tactics, frankly. When Andrew Peacock was the leader back in the 80s, they went to two elections saying the Liberals will abolish Medicare. And, so, and, he, and he lost those elections. So they learned, the Liberals have learned that Australians actually like Medicare, they value it. But the Liberals are ideologically opposed to the idea of universal health care. They, they just don't believe in it. So what they've done is they've gone quiet on the issue. And every time they're in government, they just chip, chip, chip away. They don't announce it. They don't come out with a, a press release saying, hey, these are the changes we're making. They just change the rules. So every time they're in government, less and less and less. So last year, they took more than 50 things off the schedule for Medicare um, rebates. Some of those were fair enough. They were outdated practices, outdated surgeries, which have been replaced by more modern surgeries. Fair enough. But a lot of them were like knee and hip procedures which should be covered by Medicare and which no longer are. So that, that means bigger out of cost, uh, out, of, out, of, um, uh, out of Medicare costs. The issue of bulk billing, there's, you'd be hard pressed to find a GP in regional Tasmania who bulk bills anybody other than an age pensioner. So if you're an age pensioner, most GPs will try and bulk bill. But even working age disability pensioners are finding it hard to get bulk billed now. They will have a co-payment. It may not be as much as a working person, but, that, that, but they'll be slugged with a charge because the GPs aren't getting as much on the Medicare rebates as they used to. The, or they haven't kept up with the costs, rather. But people of working age, um, they're being slugged depending on the GP and depending on the service. And this is for a GP, not a specialist. Anywhere between $30 and $60 for a consultation. So imagine you're a, a tradie or a school teacher, and you need to go to the GP because you're not feeling that well, and you're hit with a $60 fee. That's not an incentive to go next time. You'll go, well, well I'll, I just won't go to the doctor next time. And maybe, yeah, it's just, it's not the way Medicare was designed to work. Uh, and that's happening under the Liberals. They, they're just chipping away at the idea and the concept of universe universal free access and uh, we, we, we will address it. We, I think Mark Button will have more to say on Medicare more generally during the rest of the campaign, but certainly these urgent care centres are, they, they will really take the pressure off accident and emergency because of course what people are doing is 